sermon. I'm going to try to be quick. I've got a lot of scripture, and I know some people get bored when you read the Bible, but if you get bored when you're reading the Bible, you need to check yourself. Amen? And you need to, especially if you're in the house of God and we're reading the Bible and you're like, oh, show me a video or make me laugh, Pastor, but it's not read the Bible. We need to check ourselves, okay? But today um, I'm going to be showing something that is, um, I've titled the message Good News. So look at your neighbors and say, Pastor's got good news for you. I had a brother who sent something to me about a week ago and I really, really enjoyed reading it. I enjoyed it so much that I'm going to show it to you in just a few minutes. When I saw it and when I read it, I started to think about what it was saying and the truth of what I was looking at. It was so amazing and so liberating. I said to myself, this is the gospel. This is the good news. Then I stopped to ask myself, how many people are really living in the reality of what I just read? I started to think of how many people have tried to add to it and how many people have tried to take away from it. Then I remembered how the Apostle Paul wrote in the book of Galatians to the body of new believers. Who has bewitched you? That word there means to have been put under a spell or to be entranced, to be placed in a trance of some kind. You see, Paul preached the reality of a born, crucified, and resurrected Christ who came to set people free from the curse of the law. And after receiving this good news, the people started to entangle themselves with beliefs and behaviors that got them to put their trust and faith right back into the things that they had been set free from. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, it says, Paul states that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. When Paul refers to the law, he means the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law that we find in the first five books of the Bible, which instruct the Israelites how to properly worship, how to honor God through various commands and requirements. The Greek word for redeem in the Bible is Exagorasso. Exagorasso. It was a financial term that referred to the process of purchasing a slave's freedom. When a slave was redeemed, he or she no longer was bound to the rules and the expectations of a slave's life. So to be redeemed from the curse of the law means to be set free from its rules and its regulations. In other words, those who are redeemed from the curse of the law are no longer required to observe the law's commands as the Israelites were. What Christ did was by be- what Christ did by becoming a curse for us and dying on the cross was he freed us from the requirements of those laws to be in right standing with God. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law that is his sacrificial work on the cross purchased our freedom from the law and now our right standing with God comes from not our behavior or our ability to do it all right rather it comes from our relationship with Christ and our faith in who he says he is and our faith in what he said he did for us on our behalf can you say amen amen That's a lot to digest. But if you and I really stop to think about the way we act after receiving the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we can really clearly see that some of us have been bewitched. We have been put in a trance of some kind. Because we got freed from a life of performance and a life of behavior where we didn't have to keep the law like God gave the law. And let me tell you, there's nothing wrong with the law. The law was the way that they should live so they can govern themselves and live in a pleasing way to God and not kill themselves and have order. So there's nothing wrong with the law. The law is not evil. The problem is our inability to comply with the law and keep it all the time. It, it, you know, 
Without the law, we're not in right standing with God. Because we just, just look at you and say, you don't behave right. Yeah. So uh, let me get, uh, blah, 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 let me see, let me get John. Yes, you. <laughs> He's like looking up like, I hope it's not me. It's you. Can you help me just for, for a little while? C come up here. Stage. He has some fans. <laughs> oh, he just became a daddy. Yeah. How, how old is your baby? Uh, four days. His baby is four days old. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> awesome. Okay, I want you to come over here, son. Okay. And, and I want you to stand right here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Just and look at me. Okay. And then I need somebody to be Jesus. Is anybody dressed all in white? I'd, I'd prefer Jesus to be a male, if that's okay with you, Kathy. <laughs> she, wants to, she wants to be Jesus. He's inside of you. Uh, let's see. Joe, you want to be Jesus today? Sure. Yay. <laughs> okay, and I want you to be, I want you to stand right here. And I want you to face that way, okay? Okay. So, here we are. And um, you, you can't behave right. <laughs> you can't do things right. Right, Sierra? Where's Sierra? She, she's not here. She's not. The parents, your parents, John and Maricela, right? He can't. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and the, way, the way you're acting right now is unrighteous. It's, it's, it's not correct living or things. So I need to give something to you so you can be in right standing um, okay, he's representing Jesus, and I'm representing God. I've always wanted to do that, so I'm God right now, okay? okay. So, where, where's Cindy? Uh, she's, she's at Children's Church. Man, uh, she always misses it when I play God. <laughs> and I can only do that in church. I can't do it when I get home. So, I'm God, and I'm telling you that I, I created you, and I love you with all my heart and everything, but um, I created you with a will, okay? And that was something rather risky in humanity's opinion you know why would god create humanity with a will if he knew we were going to sin or what well god is so confident in himself that he doesn't take risks he doesn't know what to take a risk is and he has everything planned ahead of time so he created you with the will and you took the route of disobeying and exercising your own will. So now you're at a place where you're not in right standing with me because of your behavior and really it's your heart. Your heart's not really in the right place. I've, I've created you for us to walk together and everything but you decided there was things in your own heart that instead of giving it all to me, God, 100%, you wanted to do some things that were in your own heart and share your own things. So what I did was to keep you in right standing with me is I gave you commandments and I gave you laws. And I said, in order for you to stay right with me, you're going to have to obey these commandments and you're going to have to obey these laws. Okay. And if you break these laws and you break these commandments, then there's going to have to be something going on where you can ask for forgiveness and get right back with me. And the Old Testament, that was the sacrificing of the lambs and the bulls and all that, okay? So here are the commandments. One hand. Oh, man. <laughs> and here's the other one. All right. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now, you have these commandments that in order to stay right with me, you have to keep. Keep them with you. You have to obey them. Okay. Whenever you accidentally let one go, and there has to be a consequence for that. And you have to be put back in right, because like this, we're not in right standing. Okay? You're missing a holy law. You're missing a prescription that it's in order for you to keep your heart and your mind right. So we go to the temple. And the priest sacrifices a lamb, a bull, whatever. You say you're sorry. There's this 
sophisticated ritual that they had to perform all the time just to get back. I'm sorry, God. Oh, I'll do better next time. And so you're walking this way, walk slow, just take one step at a time, and you got all this, you know, and then here we go again. I'll drop this one on the ground. Ah, oh, Chihuahua, you messed up again. Don't break my stage. <laughs> Cash or charge. <laughs> You'll do it yourself. Okay, here we go again. It's that time of the year where you go before the priest and all that stuff, pick it up, and and all along, me, God, I had a plan all along from the beginning. Before I even created this guy, my plan was for my son, Jesus, to save him from the beginning, before the foundations of the earth. But before I revealed Jesus to him or to the world, I wanted to... I wanted for mankind to have a preview of how hard it was to stay right with God. So I gave these blocks and these weights to mankind to show mankind that I really can't do this. I can't really handle this for the rest of my life. But I had a plan. That plan was to, in the future, now start walking this way. In the future, reveal to you, yes, slowly, my son, who would take your weight and put it on himself. And before he came, if you couldn't keep the law, the Bible says you were cursed. And because this is what right standing look, if you didn't stand right with me and you dropped one of those or you didn't have them, then you wouldn't be in right standing with me and you would not be able to, we would be separated, okay? So here you come, and this is the Old Testament. Now in the meantime, check this out. In the meantime, David sins, he gets Bathsheba pregnant, he kills, he kills her husband, okay? And yet God, in all his mistakes, David, God said that he was still a man after his own heart. Why? Because when David couldn't carry these, uh, David had a relationship with God that was to the effect that he would cleanse himself and he would forgive himself, not based on a ceremony by an animal being cared, killed or the blood being shed, even though that was practiced, but it was more of, a, of an intimacy with God, a relationship with God that, that the forefathers had. And they, we read about, about them in the Bible. So... All along, and you come here, this is the first Adam, okay? This is the Adam that got us in trouble and stuff like that. <laughs> and God already had a second Adam in mind, which was his son, Jesus. So come up to this point right here. At the, at the fullness of time, time, time was essential. Um, then God sent his son into the world. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but should have uh, everlasting life. So now, Joe, you being Jesus, come and take the weights, the laws from, from John. Right? We're going to say he's Adam today. okay? And then at the moment that, that Jesus took the law from him and he paid a penalty. In other words, he died and he became a curse on the tree. The Bible says, cursed is he who hangs on a tree. And he was hanging on a tree because the Bible said, curse is he who, who he becomes a curse who, who, not, who does not keep the law and you couldn't keep the law. And this little thing about killing, sacrifice and everything. So Jesus came, took the sin, the, the inability to comply with sin from you and then you can, you can put those down. And uh, crucified on the cross, died, and then he said, it is finished. It is finished. Okay. Not sure if it was that kind of <laughs> accent, but something like that. That's kind of really cool. It is finished. 
Uh, it, I think it was more like, it is finished. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. What is finished? You don't have to carry that anymore because he carried it for you. And because of the fact that you couldn't carry that, the Bible already had established that you were not in right standing. So you were cursed. The fact that God loved you so much, he prepared Jesus before the foundation of the earth so that when Jesus came to take that away from you and they killed Jesus, the Bible says he became the sin offering. He was that lamb that they kept killing all the time, but he was the lamb of God, the perfect lamb of God without blemish. And then what happens is you come here and now you embrace, you embrace Jesus, okay? He took the law of sin and death from you, paid the price and died in your place, and now you're free. Okay? This is the good news. And you think we'd be so happy about that, but let me tell you the reality of it. We walk with Jesus, walk with him, but now pick those two things back up. But don't let go of Jesus. This is the reality of our life. And Paul looks at them in the New Testament and he says, hey, I told you he was enough for you. I told you he was the, the sacrificial lamb of God. It's kind of heavy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you feel him shaking? <laughs> yeah. Keep it up. I'm gonna, <laughs> trying, to, trying to prove a point. Mm -hmm. I know. And, and then so Paul looks at the church and says, hey, who bewitched you? I preached to you about Christ's birth, death, and resurrection. Now you're going back to the old things. And he was like, what's wrong with you? you know? And he was trying to get them to understand that when the son has set you free, you're free indeed. Okay, that, that you are set free and he has done that, the ultimate sacrifice on the cross, and now you're free. But we get saved and we get excited and, oh, the Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for all the, the weight that I had and for all the sins that I did in the past. So we're here and, and we're saved and now I'm so happy, but now... We count against ourselves and we count against others all the sins that we're going to have in the future. That's not good news. <laughs> because if I couldn't do it back here, what makes you think I'm going to be able to do it up here? Yes, there's an enabling of the Holy Spirit. Yes. But this guy's still made out of flesh. He's still made out of flesh and blood. We still talk about the flesh and the inability that they had back there to carry out the behavior to be in right standing with God, it still exists within all of us if we're not depending on Christ. Imputation of righteousness. Imputation is a word like it's imputed upon us. It means now his righteousness doesn't come from himself, but it comes from him, which is Jesus. So now when God looks at you, get in, get in front of him. This is the way God sees us as Christians. Okay? He doesn't see the nasty part of you. <laughs> and if you're, a and if you're a parent, you know what I'm telling. Some of your kids are nasty, but you still love them anyway. Amen? <clears throat> he sees the righteousness of Christ. And this righteousness of Christ, the right standing that Jesus has with God is imputed on whoever puts their faith in Christ. And now he stands in the righteousness of Christ. It's really, really hard. It's really, really good news, but it's really, really hard to grab your mind around that. But it is the gospel. Okay. Now, let me show you what I... What this brother sent me this week that I you could put those those bricks down uh, Jesus you can go ahead and sit down and Adam <laughs> go sit again and sit down.
There it is. Okay. Looks like a receipt of some kind, right? It says salvation and it says Jesus paid it all. Remember this situation right here? Sin paid for. By who? Jesus. Now let me ask you this. Is the only sin paid for was the sin you committed before you accepted Christ? You say, no, Ronnie. What sin are we talking about when it says paid for? What we struggle with? Anybody else say no? That it's more than just the sin that you did in the past before you accepted Christ? Is the sin you did last night, because you look all nice here in church, but some of you last night, are, you know, <laughs> you're okay, yeah, you're Jesus, Joe. <laughs> no, you became Jesus this morning. <laughs> what about what you did last night? Is that paid for? But it was last night. And you accepted Christ 10 years ago, and you still did something unrighteous. And you should have known better. And you're saying that is paid for? It says shame paid. What shame is that? How many have ever been ashamed of something you've done in the past? Or... Shame is just a fear of um, rejection. If you really know what I did, if you really know who I am, you're going to reject me and you're not. That's why... I'm ashamed. I, I have to cover myself like Adam and Eve covered themselves because they were ashamed. They were naked. And when we do something wrong or we do something immoral or we sin against people or we sin against God, we don't, we don't, we're not proud and we feel like, oh, you know, they're going to judge me now and I'm going to be ashamed. And, 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 but, but through not the popular opinion of people are you freed from shame, but you are freed from shame through the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're freed from shame because you don't have to live. Now, is shame bad? I hear people say, shame is not of God. Oh, shame can really be used of God. Because when you're ashamed, it pricks your conscience and it tells you, you just did something wrong. You should, it brings conviction. You shouldn't be doing that because especially now that you're a son of God or a daughter of God, you shouldn't be cursing at your wife like that. You shouldn't be stealing money like that. You shouldn't be cheating on your taxes like that. You shouldn't be, uh, you shouldn't be cursing like that. You shouldn't be all this. And shame comes like, like sometimes guilt does. And I've heard people say guilt is not of God. And guilt is a mechanism that God can use to prick your conscience and say, I'm not in right standing. But when you become full of shame or full of guilt. Now, the Bible says that there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ, but it doesn't say there's no guilt to those who are in Christ. We still, it, even, it doesn't even say there are no consequences to those who are in Christ. How many can say that I did something as a Christian, I had to pay some consequences? It's not like he forgave me, every, you know. He did forgive me, but I still had to pay consequences on this side of heaven for actions that I committed but I'm not condemned through my faith in Christ because of this interaction that I had here, okay? So our sin is paid, our shame is paid for, where we can get with God and he can cleanse us with the watering of the word and make us whole again. Our regrets can be, can be how many have seen that no matter what happens in your life, that God has this ability to, to take things that are wrong and, and, and use them for his honor, for his glory, and, and put you on a good trajectory. And, and, um, and then you, your regrets become your testimonies. They become like, they become, they become uh, your scars become stars, and they become things that you talk about how you were, but what happened when Christ came into your life, and, and you can live your life with no regrets, paid. Past mistakes, paid. Unforgiveness, paid. Hurt, anger, paid. Talking to a young man just a couple of weeks ago, says, I don't, 
know what to do with this anger. I just don't want to be like my father. I don't want to be like these people that hurt me in my life, and I'm becoming exactly that. My wife, my girlfriend, she cried. She broke down. I could tell I scared her. She, she was so scared, and when she was crying and she broke down, I caught a glimpse of my mother and how she used to be afraid and traumatized and and I'm like I'm becoming like the person that I've never wanted to be and she's pregnant and now I'm going to be a dad I don't want to be that kind of dad what, what what's going on a lot of a lot of hurt a lot of anger he, he said, uh, he said, Al Albert, uh, they, they tell me just to forget it, to move, move on. It's in the past, but I don't know. There's something that, that won't let me just move on or forget, you know? And I'm like, well, first of all, we have to recognize that there was an offense actually committed. Now, if I tell you to forget and just move on and, and go past it, it's, I'm like telling you, you don't matter. It's okay that they hurt you. It's okay that they abused you. It's okay that they, uh, they, they, they did that to you because really, at the end of the day, you really don't matter. So no, it's not okay they did that to you. It's wrong they did that to you and it's not your fault and you're, you were just a child, but it was wrong and what you're feeling is the feelings of being violated, being emotionally and physically raped and just, it's, that's why you're having such a hard time. But, so it's not okay they did that to you and it was wrong but you have a choice to make now because with God, you can move forward and he can give you a future and, you, and he can absolve all those, those wrongs and, and, and you can give them to him and you can forgive those people and you can move forward. It is a choice that, that you make. And, and, then, and then he was like, well, you know what? Uh, we talked about triggers and he goes, yeah, that's, that's true. We talked about him blacking out, you know. He gets so angry, he blacks out. Like I said, I said, son, I don't want to scare you, but you believe in God, right? And I said, you believe in the demonic powers? He goes, yeah, I do too. And he goes, you got some demonic activity in your life. When you get so angry to the point where you black out, you got company. <laughs> There's demonic activity in your life. Might not necessarily be demonic possession, but definitely demonic oppression, and you need deliverance. And he goes, I said, am I scaring you? And he goes, yeah, you're scaring me a little bit. I said, don't worry about it. So you got more power in your pinky against the enemy than anything else. You know? He just needed permission to talk to somebody he just needed to realize that he had been violated, there was offenses, he did matter, he was loved of God. And I told him, I know it's hard to believe in God when you went through all that and you were like, well, where was God? You know? But I think, looking at it from this perspective, I'm on the phone with you, you're about to have a baby, you love this girl, you're not in jail, you're not dead, and you're not in the hospital. I see that God has preserved you. And that we're having this conversation so you can move forward. You might not know that God was there, but he was there all along. And now it's your time for deliverance. I lost my job. Why, why did you lose your job? Because I woke up angry one day. <laughs> I just woke up mad and I lost my job, you know. And yesterday he said, hey, I got, a, I got the new job. And thank, thank God. And I have a new heart and new mind. And he's all excited um, because he realized that all this stuff here has already been done for you. It was done 2,000 years ago. But some of us in this room are not experiencing the freedoms of this receipt. And we don't have nothing to show us or the devil because we haven't embraced this act through faith. We haven't, we haven't received it. And look, hurt, anger, debt paid, and your change is zero. Subtotal, grand total, you owe zero. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ. Now, let's, do you really, really feel like this is the reality of your life? Or do you feel like <laughs> you owe something? Most of the time when we feel like there's a balance, it's because we behaved in such a way that now we owe. His 
actions and his behavior paid our debt completely. Now we start all over and we rack up another bill. We start all over. I got saved 10 years ago, but I've done a lot of bad things in 10 years. I can't show this receipt anymore. Because since then I've been divorced or what this or whatever you, you know. But you have to ask yourself, and I'm going to let you ask yourself, and I'm going to let you read your Bible. Did he pay for it all? Is that good news? So we have to be mindful of the fact that he paid it all. And when I'm at home struggling, you know, with something, uh, I just, I just pull this out and say, look, devil, I don't owe you a thing. Jesus paid it all. But look how you are and look what you said and look what you did. Look, look, devil, zero balance, nada. It was never based on how I behaved to begin with. I was lost, not because of the way I behaved, but because I didn't have Christ in, in the rightful place. Now, I've caught a revelation of who he is, and I believe him, and I believe what he said, and it's paid in full, and now whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Amen? Now, I'm going to read Galatians chapter 3. And I'm going to let the word speak directly to this, this situation. You foolish Galatians, Paul's telling them back then, who bewitched you. Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. He said, you saw him hanging on the cross. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law? After, or by, or by believing what you heard. Are you so foolish that after beginning by the means of the spirit, you're now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain, if it really was in vain? So can I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law? Is this, is this, is this really how you're accomplishing what you're accomplishing in the spirit? Do miracles come through this? Your ability to keep these up or does do miracles happen and does God grace you with a mir miraculous and forgiveness and all these things because you have a relationship and you believe in Christ Jesus and who he said he was and you accepted him into your heart so again I ask does God give you in his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing what you heard so also Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness Abraham believed God and it was credited to him, credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announced the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you, he told Abraham. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on the works of the law. Oh, this is heavy. <laughs> For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. You break one commandment, you break them all. So you either try to keep the commandments or you trust in Jesus completely for who he says he was and what he did for you and his love for you. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says the person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. Some versions say on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessings given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith, everybody say faith, faith. we might receive the promise of the Spirit. 
Brothers and sisters, let me, make an, let me make an example for everyday life, from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. He says, let me use life to give you an example of what I'm talking about. You are either married or not. You may not be happily married, but you're married. You are either a father or a mother, or you're not. If they say, do you, do you have, are you a father? You can't say, well, uh, these things in life are established through covenants. A man has sexual intercourse with a woman and then their seed and then they produce a child. I've never heard a woman say, oh, Pastor Albert, I'm so excited. I'm a little pregnant. You either are pregnant or you're not. You, there's either life in you or it's not. You know, you, 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 I've never, you know, when I was at my house, I never had to say, oh, I gotta, I gotta perform to be a son to my father. Now I had certain responsibilities as a son, but I didn't have to perform to become a son. I didn't even ask to be born. <laughs> now that I think about it. Him and my mom got together and like, you know, the rest. And then bam, I was there. And he could not deny me. So it is how you establish your marriage. You're not just a little married. You're either a bad husband, bad woman, a bad wife, but you are married or not. You either are pregnant or you're not. You either are someone's son or you're not. You're either, they are your children or they're not. It's not, you are either born again or you're not. <laughs> and when we get over identity crisis, we say, I am born again. I know I did this, think this way, still, you know. Paul even, Paul even says in his letter to the church, I am like a woman in labor pains, travailing until you become conformed to the image of Christ. What he's saying is like, you guys got a long ways to go. He didn't say you're, you're not saved. You lost your salvation. Because Paul knew this, whoops, can we keep that other one up? Uh, Paul knew that this receipt was the reality of those who believe in Christ. So he didn't try to scare them in saying, well, we're going to charge you again for your sin. We're going to charge you again for your anger, hurt, and all that. Says you, you, that's all been paid for you already. And he even says, I'm going to wait like somebody going through pain that's about to give a baby till you guys get matured and start conforming into the image of Christ. Sometimes we got to wait for people to get mature and conform into the image of Christ. Amen. And here's the thing that I've noticed about a lot of us. We get one of these from God, right? It's a receipt. Paid in full. Sin, paid, shame, paid, regret, paid. Past mistakes, paid. Unforgiveness, paid. Hurt, and all that stuff paid. And, you know, the reality of it is that we not only get one of these from God, but in our life, whether you realize it or not, you give one of these to other people. Except that when we give one of these receipts to people that's supposed to encourage them about the reality of what Christ has done for them, we start, instead of making this a receipt, we make it a scorecard. And we say, well, it is sin mm, I heard you went to that nightclub the other day and she's like no I did it this is just pretend okay if you're going to get offended let me know now so I can pick on Maria Victoria you'll be okay you'll survive this <laughs> okay you know what Liz I heard what you did in your past or can you believe what sister Liz did in the past and you know that the past includes last week <laughs> Because we have a lot of tolerance for things that were done like 20 years ago. But if somebody did something last week, it's, no, it's, the, it's not the past, it's the present. And we take this thing, past mistakes, unforgiveness, hurt, anger, and we erase the word paid. And we hand out little receipts to each other. 
We love to see this one that God gave us. Oh, my sins are forgiven and no shame. Uh, hurt, anger, paid, paid, uh, debt, zero. But you owe a debt. You owe me. That's not the way we keep each other encouraged. If you have a brother and sister in church, let the daddy of the church, which is the pastors, let them discipline your brothers and sisters. And you encourage your brothers and sisters. Watch out for their back, but don't seat in the, in the seat of judgment towards your brothers and sisters. Lest you pull up a receipt that you made on your own and it's inconsistent with the one God gave them. There's an insinuation in the Bible that after I become a Christian and she becomes a Christian, I am to know her in the, in the, in the steps of righteousness. I am to pursue my relationship with my brother and my sister as a believer and not start having a scorecard of how uncomfortable they make me feel because they're not doing what I want to do. You see what I'm saying? That's being religious. And that's taking the, now I, I'm not saying everybody can do whatever they want. And I'm not saying you can misbehave. That's not what I said. Do you hear me? Can you say amen if you believe me? If they even asked Paul, can we do everything now? Because we're all paid up. Oh, it's all paid up. Yeah, party time. It's all paid up. And he says, oh, no. No, 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 no. He goes, you, you, you want to put him back up there on the cross? You can't do that. After he died and spilled his blood and he paid for you, you're trying to think you can just put him back up there on the cross. He's going to die all over again for you and forgive you and then unforgive you and forgive you and unforgive you. And it's like, are you saved? Well, depends what day of the week you ask me. Because on Sundays I'm saved. But don't come around asking me on Friday night if I'm saved. You know. And that's where the devil gets us with an identity crisis, with not knowing the word of God, with not knowing what he did and who he is. And now I'm not saved and I'm not a Christian because I can carry these things around. And sometimes we all like, I can carry 20, I can carry 30. I don't care how many laws you keep. Do you have Christ in your heart as your personal Lord and Savior? Because that's what saves you. Not the number of times you go to church, or how much money you give, or all the laws. In fact, we use some of those things to use as measuring sticks so we can compare ourselves to others because it helps us make, it makes us feel a little better. You know, we see that in the New Testament. The little widow that gave just a little bit of might and the guy who gave a lot of money, he was clanging. He was clanging, oh, I give a lot of money to the church and you could hear all the coins clanging and that little wit widow gave one little might and God said she gave more than he did because she gave from her heart and the God that's here with us accepting our worship and a praise he was at some bar last night listening to some drunk man cry about how miserable he is about his life and this drunk man was remembering vacation Bible school when he was a child and he was having a conversation with God and God was right there with him just as much as he is with us here today because it's about what Jesus did and who Jesus is and not about your performance. The thing with us is that we get saved. Oh, thank you, God, for saving me and forgive me for all my sins. And then we start going to Bible school and we start doing, uh, we start, we start doing this at church and that church, and you know, we get all these accolades and everything. And then we, um, we're like, okay, God, I got it from here. <laughs> I got, I know enough Bible now. I know what's right. I know what's wrong. And without the grace of God, you can know what's right, but you won't even be able to do what's right unless God helps you to do what's right. So can anyone in this room brag about how right they live? It's by the grace of God that we all stand here. And you know what? God doesn't love the pastor more than he loves this little boy right here. He loves us all the same. He might have a little bit more grace at times for this kid because he doesn't know and he's learning and I might get whooped on the, you know. You know and, and like I said, if you belong to God, you're going to get, ooh, you're going to get spanked. Yeah, I'm being spanked right now. I was talking to Pastor TC and he's being spanked too. He's like, we're like two little boys crying, well, daddy, this is what God's doing in my life. Oh, he's doing, this is what he's doing in my life, you know. 
It's time to grow. It's, it, it, it's, it's time. I, I, I wrote this down. I don't even think I ever preached it, but it was some notes, some notes that I have. And I just pulled it out because I said, that's true. I may have included this in a message one time or not, but when we pray something like, God, I want more of you, we're waiting, we're wanting God to bring something to us or to add something to us, to give us something in a greater portion or to do something. But if you really stop to think about it, the biblical prescriptions for more of God is less of you. Because he has already given us his spirit. He, it's in the born again package. John says in John 3.30, he must increase, but I must decrease. What John was saying was that there was a direct correlation between having more of God in his life by having less of him, of himself in his life. When we pray, I want more of God, what we really mean to God is do something, start something, without realizing that many times before God starts something, it's necessary for us to stop something. Resolutions don't start revolutions repentance does in other words the problem is not that we don't have it but that we don't choose it god help me with my anger god let me get closer to you i want more of you god i want more of you and the problem is you have as much of god as you want right now today if you want more you have to choose more you got to choose between you and him and the Bible says the way you get more of God is you decrease. And I, I believe that's what's happening to me and Pastor TC. And you don't see behind the scenes when we get our tails whooped or the Holy Spirit speaks to us. I believe God is asking us to decrease. You know, decrease so he can increase. I talked I talk to a buddy of mine who's in house arrest because he just came out of jail and stuff. He goes, man, Pastor Robert, I don't know what the blank is going on. He still curses every once in a while. I don't know what the blank is going on, but my family has betrayed me. And I told you what happened to my brother, right? I hope to tell you what happened to my, my, my sister and this and that. And, and they all are, they're all roaching up on me. And I'm like, time out. What is roaching up on you mean? <laughs> Does anybody know what that means? You see, he made me feel like I was crazy. He made that stuff up. But roaching up on me, he says it's a term that means that they're trying to take advantage of you. Yeah, they're, trying to, they're trying to poke you for money. And they were doing things behind his back, getting money and talking about him. And he, and he was like, all I've ever done is be nice to them. And I give them all this stuff and I buy them shoes and up and they're roaching up on me and stuff like that. And, and, um, and he was going on and gone. He said, this has been a horrible week. And I said, you want some bad news? I said, bro, this could be happening because God's stretching you and wanting you to grow more into his image. You might, you might have to just really actually consider forgiving them <laughs> and moving on. And I know what I'm talking about because the same thing, you know, I had people roaching up on me too. And I, I, had, to, I had to forgive them. <laughs> they were roaching up and mousing up and oh, they were doing all this stuff to me and I was wrestling and wrestling and God said, let go. How am I supposed to let go of somebody I love so much? That's not what I'm asking you to let go. I'm asking you to let go of your pride. I'm asking you to let go of your scorecard and deal with them as if they had the same receipt that you have. Because I love them too and I want to pay for everything and this is the goal, that we treat each other like we're sons and daughters of God. It's so much better when you live life letting the Holy Spirit discipline people and teach them and if you just spend the majority of life loving people like God loved them oh just real quick um, let me take an example of your everyday life oh Jesus the promises were spoken to Abraham and his seed scripture did not say listen this scripture does not say to seeds but it says the promise was spoken to Abraham and his seed a lot of times we think that's people that came in faith but it says 
to seed and not to seeds, meaning meaning many people, but to you and your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. The promise came to Abraham and his seed, which through his lineage would be Christ. What I mean is this, the law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and, and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. It either depends on the promise of Christ or the law, but it can't be on both. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. Why then was the law given at all? This Paul asked them. It was added because of transgressions until the seed. Remember Joe was over here? Until the seed whom he promised referred has come. So the law was given because of the transgressions. A mediator, however, implies more than one party, but God is one. Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given to that for if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But the scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law. Locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian. Until Christ came that we might be just justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor gentle, neither slave nor free, nor male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Amen. What am I saying is that as long as an heir is under age... He is no different from a slave. Some of us are here and we can't enjoy our freedom in Christ because we're immature in our faith. And he, Paul tells us that if you're under age, you can't receive your inheritance. You still have to have a guardian over you because you don't know enough. You don't know better to make the right decisions. And the truth is not that you're not saved, but you're immature. Let me look over here. You're immature. Well, you're immature. <laughs> We're immature. And, 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 and we're like uh, uh, people that have a guardian because we can, we've not come to the conformity of Christ. But when the time has fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but you're God's child. And since you are his child, God has also made you an heir. We're heirs with Jesus Christ. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Formerly, when you did not go know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you, Paul said, that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. I beg you, my brothers and sisters, become like me, for I became like you. You did me no wrong, as you know. It was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. And even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel. And as I, if I were Christ himself, where then is your blessing of me now? When you get home, please read Galatians, Galatians chapter three and chapter four. And I'm going to just finish here in, in chapter five. And it ends um, this. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, see, because they had to be circumcised in the flesh to be saved. And then Paul tells him, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. In other words, if you have to keep the law, then Christ is of no value. 
And again, I declare that every man who lets himself be circumcised, that he is obligated to obey the whole law. If you're going to do two or three of the Ten Commandments, you've got to do all ten of them. It's not a buffet. You're either saved by how well you obey the commandments, or you're saved by how you believe and in, in your faith and trust in Christ. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You're running a good race, he says. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whether that you may be throwing you into confusion, whether that may be, will have to pay the penalty. Brothers and sisters, if I'm still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. You. My brothers and sisters, you, my friend's house, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. I hope that before we leave this place Many of us will let go, our, let go of this that we came in with, the law. I hope that we really, in our spirit, walk around with this receipt of what God has done for you. And even better, walk around with these receipts and treat each other as if Christ has done the same for your brother and your sister. If God has forgiven their sin, why does their sin offend you so much? I'm just trying to keep us from being so religious because that separates us from each other instead of drawing us together. If I think I'm better than you, Joe, because I don't and you do or you did and I didn't, you know, then that is not the spirit of Christ. What do we just read? That the whole law is fulfilled by us loving. I don't know, Matthew, I sent him really super late um, two little video clips, and I don't know if one of them is ready. Or, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with these, and I'm going to explain them, but I want you to see these two little clips just, just a couple of minutes, just in case some of you have some questions in your mind about, am I, am I really doing the right thing? Am I really saved? You know, whatever. But go, go ahead and do the first one with the little old man there. Hey, Dad, remember in John 18, 10, when Peter cut off Malchus's ear and Jesus stuck it back on? Yeah. Why would Jesus put his ear back on? At that time, when Peter assaulted Malchus, the servant of the high priest, that was a capital crime. Peter could have been executed. When Jesus restored the ear, he took away all evidence that Peter had ever transgressed. So if he would have went before the council and accused Peter of a crime, there was absolutely no evidence that Peter had ever transgressed or committed a crime. And that's representative of what Jesus has done for us. When we ask Jesus for salvation, and when we're cleansed in his blood, Jesus' blood takes away all evidence that we have ever transgressed. And it doesn't matter who accuses or what they say they have. <clears throat> when we stand before the, a holy judge, a holy God, and he looks at us after we've been washed in the blood of Jesus, Jesus has taken away all evidence we depend on him and trust in him. Now, I'm not sure about the 
ear thing that he would have been persecuted, you know, but, but I, I do agree with him that when you do something wrong, Jesus will move on your behalf and make things right that will take all transgression away from you. You know what I'm saying? And so this little old man's point was like he put the ear back on him as if he had never had an emotional outburst, had never committed a crime. They won't be able to persecute him under that law. And how many of you can say here, man, I've done a lot of things that it looks like I got away with, but it was not that I got away with them. It was that the mercy and the grace of God covered me and covered my transgressions. And what the reality of it is that he paid for it on the cross himself. Amen. How many of us can say that? I, 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 like, I like this next clip because I know some of you are going to have a little bit of clarity about where you stand with God with this next clip. Have you ever thought about the difference between Peter and Judas? I mean, you got two people that are about to do something terrible to Jesus. One's about to betray him and the other is about to deny him. And I think that both hold some type of weight. But Jesus doesn't see them two the same. You see, in the story of John 13, Jesus is washing the disciples' feet. And he's doing this as a last minute thing before he leaves the earth. And he gets to Peter and before he can wash Peter's feet, Peter says, Lord, don't wash my feet. Don't don't do that because that's not something you should be doing. Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, you can't have any part with me. Peter says, well, don't just wash my feet, wash my whole body. And Jesus says, nobody that's taken a bath needs to take a shower. Meaning that you've already been cleaned by the word I've given you. I just need to wash your feet, your journey, your walk. The Bible says that he looks at Peter and says, you are clean. And then he looks around and says, but not all of you. And the Bible says he said not all of you because he was saying that Judas wasn't clean. Well, he knew full well what Peter would do in the future, how he would deny him. So why did he say he was clean and say that Judas wasn't? It's because the difference between those two was that Judas had already set his heart to go against God. And Peter was about to make a genuine mistake. The difference between the two is heart posture, not the fall and the mess up. If your heart is right with God, even through a fall, he still will call you clean. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? The difference between the two is heart posture. Jesus knew Peter would make a mistake and Jesus knew that Judas was going to make a mistake. The difference was that Judas had given himself himself over and Peter made a mistake and he, he fell, but Jesus still declared him clean because of his faith through Christ, because of his heart posture. Some of you need to think about where your heart's been in this season of your life and you need to realize that you still have every right to hold on to this and to show it to the devil and to read it because Christ has paid everything in full. You want to write your mistakes down here? You want to write your failures? But it's not about you. It's about what Christ did. And when we catch that revelation of what he did and who he is and how he is enough and how it is finished, then we'll start to be able to walk in the place of our birthright. We will be able to carry out the responsibilities of sons and daughters. But as long as we're in limbo, not knowing where we stand because the crucifixion is outnumbered or outweighed and takes a backseat to our behavior and to ourselves. And I'm saying that if you behave too good or too bad, because sometimes we demean the crucifix or the crucifixion of Christ because like we think we got it all, I got it all down now. Look at me. Look at how I serve the Lord. Look how good I am. Look how much I know. Look, God saved me from this and from that. I've got it. <clears throat> you started out by faith and you started out by God's mercy and the journey continues out by faith and the mercy of God. Here's an old song I want you to hear before we leave. After it's finished, we'll pray. But I invite you, if you are under a weight of sin, if your Christianity is based on how good you perform, how righteous you are able to behave, God wants to set you free from that today. It doesn't make too much sense. 
you have to stop and think about first how much God loves you. And it's not that you deserve. Somebody told me the other day they were praying to God. And I think they were looking for a house. And the person, can they're here this morning. They can correct me later. And they just wanted God's will to be done in their life. And they prayed, God, just give me what I deserve. They, they felt like God was asking, what do you want? What kind of house do you want? And they said, God, give me what I deserve. And then the Holy Spirit, oh, you... You want what you deserve? And they thought about it. Oh. That sounded really religious and really good to say, but after, after she thought about it, she goes, I don't want what I deserve. I want what you have for me. And you know what he has for us? Favor. And one preacher said it best when he said, favor ain't fair. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Favor ain't fair. You have favor on who you want to have favor. And sometimes you have favor on some people because you just love them so dang much. And they don't deserve everything you give them. How many grandparents we have in the house? Raise your hand. You know what I'm talking about. You're not fair with your grandkids. <laughs> Even your kids will tell you, right? Hey, you didn't let me get away with it. Favor ain't fair, but favor is what God has over us for you and me today in this house as nasty as we can be because of our heart posture. Because one day we gave our heart to Christ. And riddled in all this time that has passed, we've struggled with our flesh, we've given in to anger, we've given in to the flesh, to lust and all that stuff. But what God is looking at is not those things, but what is the posture of your heart? Who does your heart say he is and who have you chosen and who have you given yourself over to it's time for us to take a bath because a lot of us are dirty and we take a bath by the washing and the watering of the word it's time for us to pull out our receipt and realize exactly what was done for us on our behalf and to be able to celebrate that and to let the enemy know, hey, hey, dude, you got it all wrong. You've been messing with my mind. You've been highlighting my behavior, my attitude, but I got something to show you today. I got a receipt at church today that says it's all been paid for in Jesus name. As we play this song, it's an old song, but I couldn't find a more appropriate song than this because of the words. As we play that, if you want to just come up and grab a receipt, and you can do it in the spirit. I wanted to have one of these for everybody today and, and laminate them. But God will give you one in your spirit, imprint it on your heart, okay? So as we listen to this song, you feel like you want to just, you know, just take advantage of what, what God has done for you and quit wrestling and you guys got some of these that you're carrying around you can maybe came to church with some of these the law you know, i gotta do this i gotta do that just kind of just let it go let it go john you'll fix that for me right here <laughs> okay you can put that song at a high volume please jesus is calling oh, oh come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was growing, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Ooh, oh. So leave behind your regrets and mistakes Come today, there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling oh, oh, oh. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy From the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling He's calling, yeah. oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was
honor and all the glory for this wonderful plan of salvation that the Bible says salvation belongs to our God and him who sits on the throne all the campuses we thank you Lord that you loved us so much that even before you placed Adam in the garden you had an, an alternate you had a plan to set before the foundation of the earth to redeem those you love to forgive to set them free and we are benefactors of that. We benefit from how deep and how wide your love is. Father, your love is so deep and so wide, it sets us free from our addictions. It sets us free from our flesh. It sets us free from our circumstances, from our regrets, from our shame. And it pays our indebtedness in full. For that, we give you all the honor and the glory. Help us to become a people that are so grateful for forgiveness that we become ambassadors of your love. Not general managers of the universe trying to tell everybody else what they're doing wrong, Lord, but to be ambassadors of the love of Christ and enter into our ministry, which you have told us is a ministry of reconciliation. I'm supposed to go out there and find how I can get you back with God. How I can get you too close together how can i remind you of him how can i show you his mercy his love and his grace Lord? father we just need so much more of your spirit so much more of that grace and mercy and loving kindness in these last days father where there's so much hostility and so much hatred so much religion so much finger pointing father baptize us with the love of christ you said more than once in your word if we want to be in compliance with the law of God, that all of the Ten Commandments are wrapped up in these two things, and that's for us to love you with all of our heart, mind, and soul, and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Help us to be the fo help us that to be our to be our focus this week, Father. Even when we say Amen and open our eyes, let that be a, our goal. Let that be our motivation. Let that be our focus, Father. And we'll see that same grace and power that was given to us to change distributed amongst others for them to be able to change. We love you, Father. We thank you for your word. I delivered it. It's now between the Holy Spirit and individuals that heard it to run with it, to grow with it, to ignore it, to do whatever they want. Father, but your word is powerful and I know it does not return void. We thank you for the free freedom that has been experienced in whoever may have embraced the reality of what you did for them at the cross. For anybody that came in because they're struggling, because they can't seem to be good enough, they can't seem to perform well enough, they can't seem to behave well enough, and now you have given them an out by giving them an opportunity to believe well, to believe right, 
Believing right will cause right thinking. Right thinking will cause right behavior. And right behavior will cause right emotions, Father. We thank you for that, 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 that effect, that cyclic effect. We give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. We love you. And we ask you all these things in Jesus' name. And in this season of Christmas, where everybody's talking about Santa Claus and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and, and Ice, the Ice Man and the Grinch who stole Christmas, let us lift up the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. Let us celebrate your presence, Lord. Let us celebrate the gift that was given to the world to save the world and let us in your house that call ourselves Christian that have been set free be free indeed in Jesus mighty name amen